Hey there, how's everyone doing? Um, here to uh, follow up with our previous lecture. And in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about the evidence for evolution. So in the United States, there's you know, a significant number of people who don't necessarily believe in the concept of evolution. Um, but if you talk to biologists, 99.999% you know, of biologists do and do believe that, that evolution is the best explanation for what we see. And that's because as biologists, you know, we're observing the evidence every day. And um, this gets back to kind of what I always say is why do you believe what you believe? And so what I want to show you is some of the reasons why biologists believe that evolution is the best explanation for what we see in biology. Now, uh, we could do a whole semester course on this. We do a whole semester course on this. Um, but I'm just going to try and give you some examples of the types of, of evidence that we use and that Darwin used and that biologists use that all point toward this idea of, of all current life evolving from earlier common ancestors. And so that's what we're going to talk about in this whole lecture is we're just going to give different examples of the things we use to support this idea of evolution. And so this started with Darwin, and this is why um, Darwin's argument was very convincing and his book was very popular. He was very good at collecting evidence. And this is also why, um, you know, he, he came up with the idea after his voyage on the Beagle and it was like 30 years before he published his book. But he was very meticulous about collecting evidence because he knew this was a controversial idea and he needed to basically have all his ducks in a row and have all the evidence that he could gather. And so there's several different lines of evidence that he used and that we use, such as direct observation, homology, vestigial traits, the fossil record, biogeography, um, and we're also going to add to this uh, the classification of organisms. So let's just talk about each of these and give you some examples of, of what we uh, propose that supports this idea of evolution. And so we've already talked about some of these. Before I talked about the evolution of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And so this is a direct observation of evolution. This is something that we have seen occur. Um, the same thing with viruses, like the COVID virus. Now that we can um, you know, look at the DNA, we can see in detail how these viruses evolve and how they change over time. And so that's a direct observation of evolution happening. So if you say that, you know, so evolution is the sort of thing where, well, you can't say it really happened because it happened in the past and no one has observed it. That's not true. We do observe it. Let me give you another example. Um, this is a fish example um, that's quite local. Um, and this is a fish called a sculpin. There's lots of species of sculpin. This has to do with the banded sculpin, which is found in streams around here in Kentucky. And, and um, this example I'm going to give you is in southern Missouri. So they're found everywhere, this species, and there's a particular stream that's in southern Missouri, and it's a cave that has a stream running out of it. And if you look in that stream, in the stream part outside the cave, you find banded sculpins, and they look just like other sculpins throughout Missouri and throughout the Midwest. But if you look inside the cave, same stream, you find that the banded sculpins are quite different. They're blind. They don't have any pigment. But their other sensory organs, like their lateral line, or are more highly developed. These are all characteristics that give you an advantage inside a cave. You know, if you're in a cave where there's no light, there's no reason to spend energy on sight or on pigment. It's a waste of energy. But there is an advantage to having your lateral line and your other sensory organs that sense vibration or sense electricity. It's those would be a bigger advantage in the cave. And we see that. And these are clearly the same species. They're in the same stream, but the ones that live in a very different environment 
are becoming very different. And this is like we caught evolution sort of right in the middle of it happening. And in a few thousand years, these are going to be different species. And so this is a direct observation of evolution that we see in nature. Okay, another type of evidence that, that we use is uh, homologous structures. And so these arise because natural selection does not create new traits. Natural selection just edits existing traits or tinkers or, or selects for traits that are already present. And so we call that tinkering. We call that taking something that's already there and modifying it. New traits don't just pop up because they're needed. New traits pop up when mutations happen. Mutations happen at random. And so if the environment changes, there's no guarantee that a new trait is just going to pop up that's going to work in that environment. But if a mutation occurs and it does give someone an advantage in this new environment, then natural selection can work with that. Or natural selection can take things that already exist and modify them to make them work in the new environment. We call that tinkering. And there's evidence of that in all organisms if you look. And so we've said this before and we'll say it again. Organisms don't sense that they need to change. And they don't sense what new traits need to evolve. And so if you've got bacteria and you're adding an antibiotic, or if you've got fish and, and they are living in a cave, they don't sense, oh, we need to evolve better sensory organs in this cave, or the bacteria are don't sense that we need to evolve uh, resistance to the antibiotic, those traits either pop up or they don't pop up. It depends upon if a mutation occurs at the right place at the right time. If they do pop up, then natural selection can act on those traits. And natural selection can favor those organisms that have this new trait that gives you an advantage in this environment. So whether or not the traits pop up, that is random. Mutations are random. But who survives and who passes on traits, that is not random. And so it's like I said, you know, the bacteria don't sense that they need to, to change to become resistant. It either happens or it doesn't. But if it does happen, natural selection can act upon that population and those organisms that have that resistance are going to be more likely to stick around and the population is going to change and that's evolution. But in a similar way, natural selection doesn't have to wait for mutations and, and or it doesn't have to like, it doesn't have to wait for new traits to pop up. There are existing structures or existing traits that can be modified and that's the tinkering part. And so sometimes things can get modified to a great degree. And so you start with a particular structure and the environment changes and through natural selection that structure can get greatly modified and sometimes put to a completely different use than what it originally was used for. And that's taking something that exists, tinkering with it, and ending up with something new. That is also evolution. And so you know, natural selection acted upon the giraffe's neck in this way, right? There were a few giraffes that were a little bit longer necked. And that trait became f more favorable and gave those giraffes an advantage. And as their food supply got higher and higher, those necks got longer and longer. And so we took that neck and just modified it, edited it to make it longer and longer. Another example, you got these little bones in your ear that help you hear, right? Those were originally jaw bones in fish hundreds of millions of years ago. But as the fish evolved, uh, and they evolved different ways of feeding, and they evolved into one big, you know, heavy bottom jaw, these extra jaw bones were no longer necessary, and they got modified as our as our terrestrial ancestors moved on to land, we needed a different way to hear, and those bones were there, and, and mutations occurred in those genes, and modifications occurred to those bones, and those bones got tinkered with, 
and now they have a completely different function than originally. Originally they were jaw bones, but now they're in your ear and they help you hear. That's how natural selection tinkers with existing uh, structures. And so in this way then we see similar structures in different species but sometimes those structures have very different function and that's because these species have a common ancestor and so homology is similarity relating from common ancestry and homologous structures are structures that are in two different species that are similar but they have different usage but why do you have these different structures that are used differently in different species because the common ancestor if you go back a few years several years the common ancestor had that structure and used it for one reason and then passed that structure on to its descendants but because they were in different environments they used that structure differently it got modified by natural selection so let me give you some examples of that the classic example is the forelimb in mammals okay so you're looking at figure from your book here and you've got a bat forelimb a sea lion forelimb a lion forelimb a chimpanzee forelimb and your forelimb and those are all used very differently right you don't fly you don't use your forelimbs as a wing but a bat does you don't swim very well relative to some other mammals sea lion swims very well it's got those big flippers on the front you know you use your arm to throw baseballs and and to grab things or whatever but you don't walk on your four limbs but a lion does and a chimp kind of helps balance those they're all used very differently and on the exterior they look different but if you look at the bone structure you see the bone structure is nearly identical for all of those you've got one big bone here and then you've got two smaller bones here and then you've got some kind of small wrist bones and then you've got some very tiny digits and so if you look at how these are color coded in this figure you can see that you can see that in each of these four limbs you've got that same one bone two bone wrist bone finger bone structure but they're different species and they're used in very different ways. Well, how do you explain that? The easiest explanation is our common ancestor, if you go back millions of years, our common ancestor evolved that bone structure in their forelimb and all their kids and all their grandkids and all their descendants retained that bone structure, but natural selection tinkered with it and modified it based upon different environments. Here's another figure of sort of the same thing, right? And this is showing a cat and a whale, um, but in the same idea. They're used very differently, but the underlying bone structure is very similar. Um, and so the early mammals evolved this bone structure and then passed it on to all the offspring. And so it didn't pop up, you know, it, bats didn't pop up, have to invent a whole new wing and whales didn't have to invent a whole new flipper there was already something there that just got modified based on that new environment that's uh you know again what's the best explanation for these different species having very similar structure common ancestry you can find these homologous structures in other ways too so for example if you look at uh, embryos comparative embryology shows homologies that you don't necessarily see meaning that if you look at the embryos the young the very the developing uh, organisms of different species they have lots of similarities even though the the grown version is very different and so here's a picture of a chick embryo and a human embryo right and if you look both the chick and humans have fer pharyngeal pouches gill slits why in the world do you have gill slits? Why does a chicken have gill slits? Because our ancestors were fish-like and they had gill slits. But over time that got modified and those gill slits close up and become these big arteries and veins in your neck. 
You also see that in the chicken and human, you have a post-anal tail. And so at some point in your life, you had this little tail. In fact, you still have the bone structure of it back there. Why? Why do you still have this tail? Because our ancestors had this tail. And why do chickens have the same thing? Because we have the same ancestor if you go back far enough. And so here's another figure from your book kind of showing you the same thing. And if you look at the late embryos and the intermediate embryos, they don't look very similar. And of course, if you look at the adult and the juvenile forms, they don't look similar at all. But if you look at the embryos, you see that there's lots of similarities. Um, these days, we can see tons of similarities based upon DNA. And related species have more similar DNA. And that's exactly what you would predict if we had common ancestors. And so the more recent your common ancestor, the more similar your DNA, and that's what we find when we go and look. It's just like, again, you know, you share a lot of DNA with your siblings because you have a recent common ancestor. You share some DNA with your cousins, but not as much because your common ancestor goes back further. You do the same thing with species, and we see the same relationship. And so here's a figure from your book. Again, if you look at um, uh, monkeys and, and, and uh, compared to other apes, and you compare us to other apes like chimps and gorillas, you can see that we share a lot of DNA. Our DNA is very similar, but the more recent our common ancestor, the more similar our DNA. And so what that means is, is you know, you can take a gene in a chimp and a gene in a human and just go base by base and compare them. And you see that they're nearly identical. For every hundred base pairs that you compare between a chimp gene and a human gene, 99 of those are going to be the exact same nucleotide. Right? What? How do you explain that? The best explanation is, is that we have a common ancestor who passed that DNA on to both of us. Uh, similar to homologous structures is this idea of vestigial structures. Um, and these are structures that were once used and had a, had a different function in an earlier ancestor but are no longer used in that manner or are no longer used for, for really anything, but they still stick around in modern organisms. And so again, how do you explain that? How do you explain some of these structures that don't really have any use in modern organisms? And you really see a lot of this now that we can look at the DNA. If you look at the molecular level, you find tons and tons of uh, remnant genes and remnant pieces of DNA that don't do anything in the modern organism, um, but they're clearly related. They're the same gene. There's just a little bit of a mutation, so the gene doesn't work anymore that you can find in other organisms or in early organisms. And you say, why would those genes be there unless they came from a common ancestor. Here's a, my favorite example is a chicken teeth. Okay, I'm gonna say the same thing now that I always say this picture is photoshopped. Okay, I don't want anybody saying hey my professor said chickens have teeth and he showed me a picture of it. This is photoshopped. This is a fake picture to get your attention, right? Because you know that chickens don't have teeth, right? And so that's why this picture is a fake. It's a fugazi. It's not real. So chickens don't have teeth, but they have dormant genes for teeth. Now why? Now how would you explain that if not through evolution? And how would you explain that if they didn't have an ancestor who had teeth and needed those teeth? So how do we know this? You can look at the DNA and we know how to look for certain genes and you can find the gene for teeth and in fact researchers found this gene and the gene was intact what was missing from it is the promoter had mutated you remember the promoter 
the promoter is what turns on a gene and causes a gene to be transcribed and then translated. And so the gene is there in the chickens, but the promoter doesn't work. So researchers spliced in a functioning promoter to turn those genes on. And guess what? The chickens grew teeth. And they grew teeth not like mammal teeth, like our teeth, but they were conical teeth, like you find in reptiles. Well, birds are uh, the uh, clade of reptiles. They have a close common ancestor with other reptiles. And so it makes perfect sense that the teeth gene that they carry makes a tooth like a reptile. So again, how do you explain that chickens have this dormant gene for teeth? The best explanation is, is that an earlier ancestor had it and they still retained that DNA. But the more you look at DNA, the more you see that these sorts of uh, dormant pseudogenes are common in every organism. Um, other vestigial structures that your book mentions here, again, is this uh, tail, right? That uh, our relatives had a tail, which was very useful um, when you were in trees or when you were on the ground for balance. But as humans become bipedal, that tail became less useful. But you still have that vestigial bone structure of a tail. Why would that be there? Uh, another good example is goosebumps, right? Uh, it's a little chilly out here right now and I'm getting the goosebumps. They don't do much for humans because we don't have very much fur, right? But why do we have them then? Why do we get goosebumps when, we're, when it's cold or when something startles us or, or gets us excited? It's because our ancestors had those little muscles in the skin that caused the hairs to erect. And when you've got a lot of fur, you can create a lot of air space and the air traps heat and it keeps you warmer. Or you can make yourself look bigger and aggressive and so that was useful in our ancestors, but we don't have that fur anymore. And so those muscles don't really do much. You know, getting goosebumps doesn't really do anything for you, certainly as far as keeping you warm. So why, do, why are they still there? Because it's just left over from our common ancestor. Okay. Another important source of evidence when talking about evolution is the fossil record. And I think this is, well, I mean, I don't think this, everybody thinks this. This is clearly a very important source of evidence. Uh, because if you don't believe that uh, organisms, you know, evolved from a common ancestor, and if you don't believe that the earth is very old, um, then how do you explain the fossil record? Because the fossil record is a thing. And when you consider that it, you know, most organisms don't fossilize, uh, the whole process of fossilization is, is uh, very difficult to occur and only hard parts fossilize. So, you know, any soft organisms that don't have hard parts tend to not fossilize. And even then, you know, the chance of being fossilized is very rare. Given that, the number of fossils that we found is, is amazing. And the patterns that we see, um, and the places you find fossils and the types of organisms that you see, you know, that is a, something that, you know, again, science is about trying to explain the natural world. And fossils are something that you find in the natural world. And so we want to explain those. And the best explanation that we've been able to find is that these are remnants of earlier organisms and they show how these organisms have changed over time. And so the fossil record shows that species go extinct and new species arise and, and change and species and organisms have changed over time and the, all the, the fauna and flora of the world has changed over time. And the easiest explanation is that they all evolved from earlier common ancestors. So let me give you a direct personal example, which many of you have maybe found fossils before. But this map shows 
Bay City, Illinois, population eight, maybe. It's right there on the banks of the Ohio River. This is where my in-laws live. And so we were visiting with the family and we took the kids to a gravel quarry. And we were just kicking around, looking for rocks and looking for fossils. Now this gravel quarry is in Bay City, Illinois, which is north of Kentucky. And it's up on a hill, about 172 meters above sea level, okay? So about as far from the ocean as you can get and still be in the United States, give or take. And I found these fossils there. And so I posted these online and said, what are these things? And they're called crinoid columnals. They're part of the stalk of an echinoderm, a marine echinoderm that lives in shallow water. And so echinoderms are things like starfish, um, but they're marine organisms. And this fossil is of the stalk of this marine organism. But this place where I found them is, like I said, hundreds of kilometers, thousands of kilometers from, uh, from the ocean. So how did they get there? How do you explain that? Well, if you go back about 50 million years, when sea levels were higher, the uh, Gulf of Mexico came all the way up to southern Illinois, and this area was actually a shallow sea area, and that's where these organisms lived. And these fossils are evidence that these organisms lived there and lived there a long time ago. That's the best explanation you can come up for, you know, you can come up with for this. A uh, figure from your book gives another example of, you know, again, we could talk about the, the you could, again, you could spend a whole semester talking about the fossil record and all the things we found and, and um, different fossils of different organisms, but the horse fossil record is very well developed. And you can clearly see over a period of 50 million years or so, you can see that there were several different species of horse, all of which have gone extinct, or most of which have gone extinct, except the, the you know, the horses that we see, the modern horses we see today. And you can see that over time how the bone structure in their legs changed from something with four toes and those toes became reduced and the, the middle toe became bigger and bigger and heavier until the modern horses, you've got just that one big toe that supports all the weight. Well, you can see the fossils. You can see how this changes in the fossil record. What's the best scientific explanation for that? If evolution from a common ancestor. So here's an, uh, a good example and an interesting example. Um, this is a fossil that was uh, uh, given the species name uh, Tiktaalik rosier. I think I pronounced that right. This is a famous fossil that was found way up in the Arctic Circle up in Canada. And this is a fossil of an organism that existed many millions of years ago. And it's got characteristics of both a fish and an amphibian. And so you can clearly see in this fossil that it's got gills and fins like a fish, but it's also got a neck. Fish don't have necks. This thing's got a neck. And you can see right here how its eyes are on top of its head. Fish have eyes on the side of their head. And so this is clearly what we would call a transitional form. A lot of people who criticize evolution say, well, you've never found any of these transitional forms or missing links. And there's lots of good explanations, but the fact, you know, it's not true to say that we haven't found these transitional forms. Here's a perfect example. This is when um, our vertebrate ancestors began to move out of the ocean and move into shallow water and move onto land. And you see that you've got organisms that are, um, have characteristics that help them in that shallow water. But clearly this is a form where you're transitioning from fish into amphibians. So it's another good fossil example. What's a good explanation for this? And this is clearly an organism that doesn't exist today, but used to exist a long time ago. How do you explain that? Now, what starts to make people uncomfortable is when you start to take this to this logical extension, which is that we humans also evolve from common ancestors. And 
people try to say, well, you know, as humans, we're special, or there's something different about us, or what have you. But as biologists, we say, no, we're the product of this same process. And we've devoted a great deal of effort to finding, studying, and explaining the fossils of our recent common ancestors. And so, in doing so, we've been able to develop a pretty good idea of the different species that existed before us and how they led to us. And that's what this cladogram is trying to show you here. Um, and again, each of these branches is when a group split off and then formed a different species. And this goes back about six million years. But this is um, this is a tree that shows the relationship of humans to our uh, earlier ancestors based upon what sort of fossils we found. And so about six million years ago in Africa, there existed a population of organisms, and that species does not exist anymore, it hasn't existed for a while, but its offspring st you know, still exist, and we're one of those offspring, and chimps are one of those offspring, but a lot of their offspring have gone extinct. And if you saw this species, which you know, again, doesn't exist today, but you would recognize some things. Just like when you look at a chimp, you recognize things when you look at a chimp. You know, when you look at a chimp's hands and when you look at their face, uh, and you look at their general body structure, you see the similarities between them and, and us, right? And if you saw this earlier ancestor, you would see some of those similarities too, but it wouldn't look like, you know, a chimp or a human. But you can see in the fossil record, you can see groups splitting off, which we show here, and then becoming new species, and then groups splitting off and, uh, from that group and forming new species. And you can see species existing for, you know, a few hundred thousand years, a couple million years, and then going extinct. And so most of these species, which we found fossil evidence of, have existed for a while and then gone extinct, except for us in chips. So the fossil record um, is, again, one of those things we could talk about all day. Um, another source of evidence that Darwin pointed out, and we like to point out, that suggests all things came from common ancestry, common ancestor, is biogeography, or the distribution of living things around the earth and the patterns that we see in that distribution. And so again, do a whole class on this, or a whole semester on this. But if we look at the geographic distribution of species and look at those patterns, and you know the best scientific way to explain those patterns is through evolution from earlier ancestors. And when you combine this with other sources of information, um, geology and geography and physics and all these other sciences, and you know we found out that, or, or, or we believe that at one time all the continents on Earth were just one big continent called Pangaea. And since then, because of continental drift, uh, Pangaea broke up and formed the different continents that we see today, and we know that the continents are are moving even today. And then, of course, those continents move around and they slam into each other and they make mountains and all kinds of of uh, fun stuff happens. And so here's a figure, kind of showing Pangaea, and then you know that's 225 million years ago, and then over time how these continents have broken up and distributed themselves into what we see in the present day. Well, biogeography looks at this and, you, and says this helps to explain the modern day distribution of a lot of organisms. So just one example here. Um, where do we find marsupial mammals? Most marsupials are found in South America and Australia. And so Again, what's a marsupial? The, you know, you're mostly fam uh, familiar with say, kangaroos. Uh, here in North America, our only marsupial is the possum. These are mammals, like you and I, but we're placental mammals. And so the big difference is, placental mammals, the uh, 
developing embryo stays inside the mother for a long time and feeds off the placenta and then is born at a larger size. Whereas in the marsupial mammals, um, the babies are born much earlier and then they crawl into a pouch that the mother has and then continue developing outside of her body but inside that pouch, right? And so where do you find those? Well, South, you know, here in North America, when you think of a mammal, you're thinking of a placental mammal. Like I said, the possum is the only marsupial that we have here. All the other mammals you're familiar with, you know, coyotes and beavers and deer, these are all placental mammals. But down in South America, there's lots of marsupial mammals and there's lots of like different species of possum. And in Australia, you know that Australia has got lots of different marsupial mammals. In fact, they don't have any native placental mammals in Australia. But here's the thing. Think about, you know, look at that map of present day world, or you know what the world looks like. Where is South America and where is Australia? There's a huge ocean between those two. How do you get the same type of mammal in these two areas that are so distant from each other? Well, the, the best answer is they used to not be that distant. And if you go back 225 million years, you can see how Australia and South America were close to each other when Pangaea, before Pangaea broke up. And those marsupials, they actually evolved further north, but then they, they took hold down in that southern part of Pangaea. And so when then Pangaea spread apart, that's how you get marsupials in South, Afri South America and Australia. And so here's the same map of Pangaea, but with modern political boundaries, which I think is kind of cool. And so you can see then where South America is tucked in up next to Africa, and you can see where Australia is, and you can see that they're all connected across Antarctica. And so, again, you see most marsupials today in South America and Australia, which are separated by a big ocean today, but they used to not be. Now, we always say that, you know, good scientific hypotheses make predictions that can be tested. And you think, well, in evolution, you know, this is something that happened 200 million years ago. There's no way you can do an experiment. There's no way you can test it. But that's not true. You can still make predictions. And so if you believed that this is why, you know, the marsupials spread across these continents when they were connected, then you could make a prediction that, well, there should be, there's no marsupials that live in Antarctica today, but there ought to be remnants of them. There ought to be fossils in Antarctica if this were true. And such fossils have been found in Antarctica. And so you don't have those mammals there today, but you've got fossils of those mammals. Well, how do you explain that? The best explanation is that all those continents were all connected at one time, and those marsupials lived throughout that whole region. And then as the continents moved, the marsupials moved with the continents and, and you know, sort of disappeared from Antarctica. So that's the idea of how biogeography can help us, you know, explain and, and support this idea that all living things evolved from a common ancestor over a long period of time. Okay, now another source, uh, another source of evidence that your book talks about and that we like to use has to do with the classification of organisms, of modern day organisms. And so Linnaeus was the first one to do this back um, in the uh, 1700s. And starting, you know, Linnaeus kind of pointed out that if you study organisms, you can arrange them into a hierarchy of groups. And no matter what the organism, whether it's a plant or an animal or a fungus or a bacterium, you can find that, you know, if you can take organisms and you can see that, that some organisms are more similar and should be grouped together, but you can group those groups with other groups uh, based on some other similarities, but you could always arrange living things in this hierarchy of groups, and we call that taxonomy. And Darwin took a look at this and realized, oh, you know, 
what explains that pattern? That's a pattern that we see in the natural world. You know what would explain that? If things evolved by common ancestry. And so those that had a recent common ancestor are going to be grouped together. And those that have a more distant common ancestor are going to be in different groups. And you can explain this hierarchy that we see based upon this idea of evolution from a common ancestor. And so here's a figure from your book uh, kind of showing you this example. And so this is, um, you may be familiar with this uh, taxonomy, and I want you to know these. This is just something that every biology class talks about. These are the, the taxa that we use today. And um, there are several different mnemonic devices that people use to remember these. This is the one I use. Um, duh, King Philip called out for good soup. So now when I was an undergrad, it was just King Philip called out for good soup. The domain was not something that we used in, in this, um, in this uh, uh, process. But um, these days we realize that you've got a few different domains that help to separate and, and group all living things. And so now we say, uh, duh, King Philip called out for good soup. So domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. But these are arranged, like I said, in a hierarchy. And so each individual species, the species is really the only thing that exists in nature. The rest of these are groups that we have constructed to help us organize these. But each group can be organized inside other groups. And so you see a species is within a genus, which is within a family, which is within an order, which is within a class, and so on and so on. And so that's what you know Linnaeus recognized and biologists have recognized for a long time, that you can take organisms and look at them and organize them in this way. How do you explain that? And then when you start to, modern biology, when you start to look at DNA and you can see DNA similarities between different organisms, and you can arrange them in this hierarchy. How do you explain that? Common ancestry does a good job of explaining that. And so you have a lot in common with others in your genus or your family in these, these smaller groups, right? And so if you compare us to chimps, you know, we have similar bone structure and similar organs and similar behavior. And, and the DNA we already said is very similar. And they're in our family. But if you look at other organisms in these more broad taxa, like the kingdom or the domain, you still share common things with them, but you, know, you don't share as much, right? And so we're in the domain eukarya, we're eukaryotes. So we have that eukaryotic cell. And so if you look in that domain, you see that, that you know, there's jellyfish and, and uh, alligators and whatever else they've got in here. And so, you know, we don't share a whole lot with, you know, say jellyfish, but we do have that eukaryotic sh uh, cell. And we share that with all the others in that domain eukarya. And so we can organize living things in this way. And, a, you know, what makes the most sense is that the reason we can do that is because we have common ancestry. Um, and so that's what I'm kind of saying here. You know, where did this pattern come from? It came from our evolutionary history. Um, and so if you compare organisms, you know, within something like a domain, they don't have a whole lot in common. And that's because their common ancestor goes back billions of years. And so the common ancestor between us and other eukaryotes, you have to go back a long, long way to the first eukaryotes. And so then those eukaryotes split and formed all these different groups, but passed on this eukaryotic cell that all the descendants got. And that's why we see all these organisms that have that eukaryotic cell. But if you look at like, compare us to chimps, we share a lot more. We're a lot more similar. That's because our common ancestor only goes back about six million years. And so the more recent the common ancestor, the more similar you are to other organisms. And that's how we can organize these living things.
And so that's what they're showing you in this figure here. The more recent the ancestor, the more characters are shared. And this goes back to this drawing that uh, Matt Bonin did that kind of extends this idea of common ancestry, right? And so again, think about your family tree, which you, you can wrap your head around a family tree. And if you have siblings, you share a lot of characteristics with those siblings. You look a lot like your brothers and sisters. Why is that? Because you have a recent common ancestor. Your parents, you all have the same common ancestor. You all have the same parents and you got those traits from your parents. Now if you look at your cousins or your second cousins, you don't look as much like them. You still share a lot of characteristics, but not as many. Why is that? Because your common ancestor with your cousins goes back a couple of generations. You still have that common ancestor. You can still trace your family tree back to the same people, your grandparents or maybe your great grandparents if it's a second cousin. And so they passed on traits and then they, those traits got passed on. And so you and your cousins inherited some traits because they came from the same ancestor, but not as many. You don't look as close because your ancestor goes back further. So just take that idea and just walk it back. Years, millions of years. And you can start to see those relationships among species. And so you can look at us and other mammals and you can see that we share traits with other mammals. Why is that? Because we trace them back to the common ancestor of all mammals. We have a recent common ancestor. But if you compare us to things like amphibians or fishes, we still share things. We share things with fishes, right? We've got a backbone. Um, you know, we've got a brain. We have eukaryotic cells. We share a lot of things with fishes, but not as much as we share with other mammals. That's because our ancestor with fishes goes back several hundred million years. Okay, so that's just scratching the surface. Um, again, we could go all day and talk about all these different things we see in biology that all support this idea of evolution. So, as always, you know, you ask yourself, why do you believe what you believe? And why do most biologists believe that all organisms arose from common ancestors? Because we're looking at this evidence every day and it makes sense. Um, again, this, you know, you may believe that uh, life on Earth arose in a different manner. And that's fine. You have to ask yourself, well, why do I believe that? As a scientist, we have to explain these patterns using only natural phenomena. And so evolution is the best scientific explanation for what we see. Um, we've got just tons and tons of evidence and it all makes perfect sense. And, uh, and that's cool and I think it's fascinating. Um, but like I said, I could, you know, we could go on and on about this, but I think I've gone on enough. So um, that's all I've got for now. Let me know if you've got any questions, and I'll see you later.